And this is in fact the first time that we're publicly talking about uh, the integrated trust network. And I'll give you a, an early glimpse um, as to what that is. And the other panelists will, will, will also um, uh, in, uh, tell you about how this can be used. So really, uh, let's get going. So I'm sure everyone has seen the blue tick. Yeah, it's not one that you find when you went walking in the forest, but it's on social media websites. Um, and it is a, a sign of trust. But why do we trust this? Well, we assume that Instagram has done um, its due diligence on Netflix and that Netflix is actually Netflix. Um, and it works because the blue tick is part of the technical architecture of Instagram, meaning that users have trust in this attestation, right? It was done by, uh, by Instagram, shows up in the Instagram, Instagram manages everything centrally, all good. Unfortunately, this online trust is neither portable nor interoperable, right? Netflix can't take the blue tick and uh, take it to Twitter um, or take it to anywhere anywhere else um, um, because who knows where they came from, right? So that is highly unfortunate because for Instagram, it works quite well. Um, and the next question is why do we not trust an, an order receipt um, from Amazon if we get it via email? Well, even if we had the blue tick, it couldn't really be trusted because it would not be open on a trusted platform. It just pops up in your in your in your email box. Um, you cannot trace the root of trust uh, back to any authoritative issuer, um, as in the previous example with uh, with Instagram. So that's really a problem. And you know, I'm sure you, you get that stuff all the time. So um, this is actually really where decentralized identifiers, DITs, and fair public credentials uh, VCs come in. This uh, a decentralized or federated trust solves the provenance and identity problem because it becomes now portable and interoperable. So think of DITs and VCs as the blue tick for like physical and digital data. It, using cryptography, blockchain, and new innovative technical standards, one can now attach a trusted digital assertion through a digital signature to data such as an Amazon order in both the digital and physical realms. So I could actually turn that email receipt into something that is um, uh, both trusted, um, portable, and interoperable. So what, what, how does that actually work? Well, it is uh, verifying data using a unique identifier that's attached to this data. So think of verifiable, um, the example, easiest example here is a license a car and its license plate and its registration. So verifiable credentials are like the registration of the car because they provide information about the type, make, specs. They're very clear and very difficult um, to fake. Um, in fact, they're called um, temper evident. Right? If you were to change it, then uh, anybody would, would, would notice that. Decentralized identifiers, on the other hand, they're like the car license number because they provide information about who owns the car um, and they can be checked against, for example, a trust, trusted registry, such as blockchain. So if you, if you combine um, uh, decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials for a car, anybody can, can verify um, uh, and, uh, um, whether a car is registered, um, to whom, or to what, and uh, that can be digitally proven anywhere to anyone, um, no matter which system they use. And that's really important. So um, how does it work in the real world? All right, Our, um, so Roger, not directly Roger, but Roger's company, Denso, is sending, some, sending a package to BMW via FedEx. There's one part that they really need, and it's, it's a handcrafted car, so but only Denso has it. So that's why they're sending it via FedEx. It's a little construed, but maybe not. Um, so and FedEx says, hey, thanks. Let me check that this data is trusted. And um, so 
uh, Denzel says, oh, wait, 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 so we have side the BMW package data using a public signature you can look up. So the data references a public identifier, which shows a legal entity identifier. FedEx goes, okay, that's great. Our system has verified the authenticity of this data and of Denso. That's wonderful. Now FedEx goes and, and, and takes that and goes to BMW with the part that BMW de de desperately needs and uh, says, now we can assure our own transport data uh, referencing the verified package data from Denso um, with our own signature. So we're, so you're presenting what Denso gave FedEx and the attestation verifiable credential from, from uh, FedEx uh, to BMW. BMW can now uh, um, ascertain that A, the package was really sent from, from Denso that really contains what it's said to con contain and that FedEx actually is, is, not, is, not, is not lying. So um, uh, with their uh, attestation that FedEx is really FedEx. So that is really, really important um, because right now everybody is, is, is taking it on faith when the FedEx driver shows up, it's actually a FedEx driver, could not be. So um, uh, typically is, but in principle it could not be. So you can, you can definitely, definitely, definitely verify it. If you ever wondered where packages is, is coming from and who that is, you can now verify that with that. So it, it has real world, wonderful um, application. And here is where I want to introduce you the federated trust network, the integrated trust network, um, uh, because this allows now to generate federated trust, right? So we have now we're creating a trusted federation. Since every company in that federation will have a verified legal identifier, any company can issue and verify data from one another in the ecosystem. Therefore, this ensures maximum efficiency and trust across the life cycle of products and, and services, right? Because the federated entities are trusted. Um, if they're issuing a trust certificate to others, just like a certificate, authority, they can now be trusted and so forth. So you can extend uh, this network, this web of trust uh, further and further out. That means data sharing um, is now uh, enables that can, you know, with this underlying trust network um, ensures complete visibility over the what, where and how for entire supply chains at the same time. So MEF and Mobi members or building such a uh, federated trust network, trust federation. That's the ITN. Oops, that was unintentional. Um, so what is the integrated trust network? Think of it as the Web3 equivalent of a global phone directory um, that you can actually trust. Um, the integrated trust network is a collection of standalone compute nodes connected via the internet using block blockchain protocols, keyword is the S here, it's more than one. Um, so this is agnostic to the actual uh, um, blockchain protocol. Each node is a duplicate of all the other nodes in the ITN using blockchain consensus and data replication um, techniques. Um, and each node is hosted by a separate business entity in a public or private cloud. So while the actual network um, is permissioned, it is public. So anybody can access um, any um, ITN node and request um, uh, a decentralized um, identifier um, uh, and can update those identifiers uh, and uh, even some certificates um, such as uh, trust certificates, just like a CA are, are issued um, by the ITN to MEF and MOBI members. And they then themselves can utilizing this root of trust um, issue their own uh, certificates, even certificates of trust. And therefore we have a web of trust. Um, and that is it. Um, in the interest of time, I want to um, hand it over to Tram to tell us uh, a little bit more about the new economy of movement and um, 
the, how the ITN plays into that. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, my name is Trembo. I am co-founder and um, co-director of Mobi, Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative. Uh, the convergence of these technologies that you see here uh, permits any connected roaming entity, uh, whether a person, a vehicle, device, uh, like your cell phone or a piece of infrastructure to have a trusted digital identity, um, can communicate and autonomously participate as an independent economic agent in transactions. Uh, these usage-based economy of things transactions will create new opportunity to monetize infrastructure, roads, and vehicles, to name a few, uh, enable a less uh, centralized transportation ecosystem, um, and create new usage-based mobility services, uh, such as seamless multimodal transportation, uh, urban road tolling or congestion pricing, uh, usage-based insurance, uh, supply chain track and trace, and numerous other use cases that we have yet uh, to imagine. These use cases and transactions will create a multi-trillion dollar uh, new economy of movement. The new economy of movement requires a new way of identifying people and things, uh, one which is blockchain-based, self-sovereign, decentralized, and machine-readable. So for Web3 commerce, every stakeholder needs to have a digital twin. And then DIDS and VC, uh, what Andreas just presented, are required for the digital twins to be trusted in a decentralized ecosystem. Mobi first standard released in 2019 was the Mobi VID standard. Uh, it is a vehicle's digital twin uh, based on the international VIN standard and the W3C DID standard. Uh, at the time, the DIT standard was a work in progress, and now it is a standard of the W3C. The most recent standard uh, for Mobi, uh, we have had 13, is the Mobi Trusted Trip. Uh, it is perhaps the most important pillar for the new economy of movement. Uh, it is the foundation for the pay per use economy. Um, a trip is a roaming entity journey from one place to another. Uh, Mobi Trusted Trip uh, links a roaming entity's self-sovereign identity uh, with its timestamp location or ubiety uh, and enable the linkage to be verified throughout any trip in a trusted network. So therefore the trip is the basic unit of information uh, for monetization in a service economy. And for the trip to be useful, it must be trusted by all parties in the transaction. Uh, the users, the providers, and the infrastructure owners. Uh, Mobi Trusted Trip enables marginal cost pricing for usage-based transactions, and it ensures that the data can be trusted uh, when using a decentralized network. Here are some completed and in-progress Mobi Trusted Trip pilots being demonstrated by the Mobi community. Uh, I don't have time this morning to go into them with details, uh, but I would encourage you to go to our website, dlt.mobi, uh, to read up on them. Uh, we have a lot of details on them. Our most uh, recent pilot is with the EU Commission uh, to track tailpipe uh, carbon dioxide emissions for 280 million vehicles. Uh, <clears throat> the fundamental for all these pilots that, are we, that we're working on is, of course, the trusted identities. Uh, for this specific use case, uh, it is essential uh, to measure tailpipe emissions accurately in an easily verifiable and trusted way. Um, however, the lack of standardized solution uh, means efforts are fragmented and ultimately not scalable. Um, you can't mitigate something if it's not being measured, and to measure accurately, uh, trusted identity is required. Uh, Mobi and EU Commission tested the performance uh, and scalability of MobiNet, which has now evolved into the ITN uh, for transactions between the EU Commission, uh, 27 member states, registration authorities, and the vehicle itself uh, using uh, MobiNet ITN digital twins. Of course, this is just a tip of the iceberg. 
uh, as digital twins are how connected entities transact in Web3. Uh, digital twins turn one-time uh, product sales into continuous service revenue that spend the entire value chain. And this is why we see billions of dollars uh, being invested by VC in Web3. Uh, Facebook changed its name to Meta and Google launching a new uh, blockchain division for Web3 commerce. As mentioned, um, for digital twins to be truly decentralized and trusted, uh, they need DIDs and VC to make them Web3 ready. Uh, interestingly, uh, when the DIDs 1.0 uh, standard uh, went for a vote at the W3C last year, uh, the vast majority of the votes were in favor of the standard. And there were three objections, and they were Google, Apple, and Mozilla. The three biggest browser vendors, uh, which raised a lot of discussion within the W3C. Our community is way ahead of this, um, this wave. Our first digital twin standard uh, was released in 2019. And ever since we've been building the Web3 infrastructure uh, to promote a more equitable uh, privacy preserving ecosystem. For organizations, large and small, uh, there's never been a better time to join. Uh, we have the first mover advantage, uh, Mobi, MEF, and other consortia um, who wish to join the ITN have the opportunity to capitalize on this by running nodes in the ITN. It is a member's own and operated organization. Um, so do come and join us. At this time, I have a four minutes video on the Mobi Trusted Trip that ties everything together. Uh, let me start sharing. With urban populations on the rise, cities around the world are looking for smarter ways to manage their existing infrastructure. At the same time, the way people like to move around is also evolving. They want a seamless and efficient experience of integrated modals of transit. A trip is broadly defined as a roaming entity's journey from one place to another. A roaming entity can be almost anything, including a person, a vehicle, a smartphone, or a package. Moby defines a trusted trip as a journey whose unique attributes are validated by authorized entities within a decentralized network. Moby Trusted Trip has two essential components, verified identity and ubiety certified through time. Decentralized identifiers, DIDs, are a new type of identifier that enables verifiable decentralized digital identity. According to W3C, a DID refers to any subject such as a person, organization, thing, data model, abstract entity, etc., as determined by the controller of the DID. Why is decentralized identity important? As our lives are increasingly linked to apps, devices, and services, we are often subject to data breaches, and privacy loss. A standards-based decentralized identity system can provide greater security, privacy, and control over our data. Ubiety is a unique position in space and time. For a trip to be trusted, it is required that a roaming entity's verified decentralized ID is linked with its location in space over time, along with a minimum set of industry-accepted proofs to ensure that the trip's data can be trusted. Blockchain acts as a trust anchor in a decentralized network, allowing third parties in the network to verify ongoing and completed trusted trips. As the key primitive of the new economy of movement, the trusted trip together with a mobility platform such as Setopia will unlock marginal cost pricing for countless mobility as a service transactions, including urban road tolling, meter free parking, congestion management, carbon and pollution taxing, usage based insurance, and many more. Setopia is an open and decentralized mobility platform that facilitates third party verification. Zootopia allows the onboarding of decentralized identities for users and providers, along with vehicles, devices, services, infrastructure, and data sets to create the seamless, secure, and private mobility experience that users demand. To understand how the trusted trip works, let's take a look at Zootopia and a trusted trip in action.
After completing a trusted trip, Zootopia users can see relevant data in their trip summary. Trip data is stored on the user's device. Zootopia never collects this information. Unlike other map-based mobility apps, Zootopia does not store users' data. However, Zootopia users can choose to share their data for rewards and incentives. In this way, it not only protects data privacy, it gives users control over their own information and how that information is used. By unlocking almost every use case imaginable for on-demand personalized usage-based mobility, secure and private, the trusted trip together with a decentralized platform like Zootopia will enable more sustainable, equitable ways of moving, transacting, and ultimately living. And that's it for me. Let me stop sharing. Um... Daniel, please. Thank you very much indeed, Fran. Let me just uh, share my screen. Here we go. And go into slideshow mode. And we're ready to go. So uh, I'm going to talk about the, um, the telecom point of view of the integrated trust network and what Andreas and Tram have just described. But first of all, a little bit about MEF. Uh, MEF is a uh, Global Industry Association, we're a standards organization um, in the area of network connectivity, cloud and uh, technology providers. And our members uh, work on creating uh, through consensus standards that enable essentially interoperability in the telecom industry to grow the market for everybody's uh, benefit. And uh, our membership uh, is two thirds uh, service and cloud providers. Um, the sort of names like uh, AT&T and Verizon and uh, Microsoft Azure through to uh, many, many other service providers, smaller scale, more regional. Um, so they're about two thirds of our membership where the rest are technology providers that uh, provide the capabilities for our service provider members, uh, players like Nokia and Ericsson and Cisco and Juniper and so on. Um, and our membership uh, it represents uh, uh, a whole global uh, community of, uh, of telecom uh, uh, with uh, getting on for half uh, in North America, Central and Latin America and about a quarter in uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa and uh, in APAC respectively. The, the sort of participants we have from our membership range from uh, the very technical, uh, the network architects and engineers through uh, IT managers, developers, security professionals and product management marketing and of course, uh, business executives. So um, that's a little bit about MEF why is uh, the integrated trust network uh, and, and what it potentially offers so important to our members and the industry? Well, um, the, the challenges faced by our members as digital service providers and, and suppliers for digital service providers are that supply chains are becoming ever more complex. And what does that mean? It means that the products that our members and the industry in general are offering are becoming broader and more and more complex. So they're made up of many, many more components that they have to source, even if they're digital components of, of services, they have to source from uh, partners, whether it's because they don't have uh, ubiquitous connectivity or they don't have the um, they don't have the capabilities uh, in house. They need to source them outside. So that's one aspect. More and more complex uh, complexity in the products. They are then relying on an ever increasing number of partners in this supply chain uh, in order to support these complex products and services. And the end customers that they're supporting with their products and services are no longer just organizations, perhaps that was the case 30, 40 years ago, and not just uh, human users uh, working for organizations or individuals, um, but now in the era of IoT, 
we're talking about billions of, of devices out there uh, and they are end users just like organizations and individuals. So with these supply chains becoming ever more complex, um, that means that there's going to be more and more need for automation. Automation to support not only internally within the, uh, the service provider, but between uh, different entities, between the different participants in the supply chain to support these very high volumes of business transactions. And we can think of them as micropayments, for example. So you're gonna have uh, more and more rich, high value on-demand digital services, not the sort of connectivity services that traditionally would be uh, contracted for a long period of time. No, it's like cloud services, any other type of um, online service now, the types of services that telecoms are offering are, uh, are on demand and with more and more features. And also there's a need to reuse uh, unused inventory. So if a service provider isn't using uh, inventory, it's going to waste. If they're not using it at that time for a customer, well, then they should sell it wholesale for use in somebody else's product. There's an increasing demand for visibility throughout the supply chain, uh, understanding what the status of shared inventories for a product with partners in the supply chain and the topologies of the offering. Um, proof of origin of product and service components, very important as well in telecom, just like in many other industries and verticals. Uh, regulation, national defense, we've heard about of course, all these examples of attacks on supply chains in the digital world as well. So that's something that's very important to uh, digital service providers. And again, uh, ESG metrics, whether it's carbon footprint, you know, power consumption and so on and so forth. So that's uh, a major challenge. And the last one is being able to um, get trusted information from multiple sources uh, uh, and rely on it for the purposes of cybersecurity or knowing that a service level agreement is actually, uh, is actually being implemented end to end across multiple players in the supply chain, um, reaching consensus on, uh, on issues that, uh, that affect a product that spans multiple uh, entities. So business transactions, visibility, trusted information from multiple sources, how to deal with that. So what, um, what uh, we're talking about today is essentially enabling uh, MEF members among many, many others in the connected economy that Andreas and Tram referred to is to enable them to uh, use essential Web3 infrastructure for these new challenges that they're facing. And we look at this as having uh, a model of three layers and the three layers are uh, trusted business, uh, trusted identity and the uh, trust network. So if we look at that top layer, the trusted business layer first, that is really where all of those challenges that I described with the supply chain uh, are, are really operating. Um, the ability to do business between telcos, uh, telcos and hyperscalers, uh, between uh, telecoms and uh, uh, enterprise users, um, but also between ecosystems. It's very important for our industry to be able to do business um, in an automated way with other ecosystems. And our collaboration with Mobi is, is, is one example of, of that importance, the ability of telecoms to, to do business with uh, players in the, uh, in the mobility space that we'll hear from uh, Roger shortly from Denso as an example. So when we look at it, uh, at the trusted business layer, we're, we're thinking of things like what we call trusted bilateral, uh, smart bilaterals uh, for uh, smart contracts between, um, between uh, buyers and sellers and using our APIs. Uh, Tram mentioned earlier the examples of Setopia and the trusted trip. Again, that would run in the trusted business layer. 
So th this is just the start of what we're doing in MEF uh, to address the needs of the trusted business layer, the standardization um, that we've, uh, we've developed in MEF 114 and LSO APIs. But for all that to happen at the trusted business layer, we need that essential Web3 infrastructure underneath. We need the trusted identity that Andreas was talking about, and we need that trust infrastructure. We need to, for all of that trusted business and those applications and services to be able to access a decentralized identity service in order to support uh, complex digital uh, supply chains and access to digital twins and verifiable credentials and proofs also um, described by TRAM. And we need to be able to uh, access blockchain. We need that trust infrastructure layer underneath as well. So in order to achieve that trusted business, all that that's going on at the top layer, we need the integrated trust network. And that's why it's so important to MEF and its members uh, to be able to collaborate with Mobi, and we hope with other ecosystems and other consortia from other ecosystems so that we can all use and share the same trusted uh, infrastructure and trusted identity in the form of the integrated trust network to enable trusted business and to address all of those challenges that not only are our members facing, but many, many industries are facing with all the opportunity that that brings. So um, with that, I will stop and hand off to um, Antonella. Thank you, Daniel. And good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Let me share my slides. Let me know if you can see it. Be in presentation mode. So in the next minutes, uh, I'm going to present perspective with respect to the integrated trust network. And for the ones who don't know, Sparkle is a global network service provider with connectivity worldwide. You can see the map of our connectivity in, in the screen. So this is more, this brief presentation is about the operator's perspective, following up what Dave, Daniel already mentioned. So if we followed us so far, so we have mentioned the mobility ecosystem. We have mentioned the trusted trip, which can be devices, uh, people connected uh, that make transactions. And among other things, uh, the key pillars uh, that enable this trusted trip is uh, the network and the trusted identity. We mentioned that. Because uh, the network means that uh, entities need uh, communication to transact. And so there is a perspective that sometimes, sometimes is hidden that is behind this mobility ecosystem. And this is the ecosystem of the networking, which Sparkle belongs to. What does it mean? It means that every single user or device that is in movement within this trusted strip has to communicate to other devices, to the cloud, in a trusted way. So the telco ecosystem supports and enables uh, the mobility ecosystem and enables the trust strip. What are the requirements that uh, the mobility ecosystem puts on the network? There are mainly two, provide a secure connectivity. And uh, as Trump said, uh, it is a connectivity that, that has to be anytime but tracked, has to be anywhere but with your variety and anyhow, but in mobility. On the other hand, it has to be trusted. So the network has to release the trusted identities and this can be done through the ITN node federation. Are all of these things uh, telcos? In general, I would say no, because uh, the infrastructure is already there. The modern networks uh, are scalable, are dynamic, uh, provide mobility, are distributed, uh, are automated and have a very verified assets and processes in their DNA. So the infrastructure is there. And with that respect, the telco infrastructures today are ready to sustain this new economy of mobility. But as Daniel was mentioned previously, there are challenges in fact. Challenges related to the supply chain complexity and scalability demand 
to the high volumes of connected devices that will explode very soon what happens. And for sure, security that will go into another level. And we will see later on that the disaggregation of the entities that are part of this ecosystem will make the number of identities exploding. So with that respect, ITN will really boost more network and process automation, making the network at a different level of scale in terms of automated process in terms of simplification of the processes and also security levels. So as Parkol, we see, and probably as many telco operators within uh, these um, ecosystems, uh, we see a lot of benefits uh, that come from the synergies between the telco and the mobility world. Because there will be requirements that will make our network evolve in the right directions. And talking about synergy, I would like to reflect on this simple example in parallel that we found pretty interesting. So talking about the, the new economy, we have seen that there are assets, there are devices, people that uh, needed to communicate. And uh, the asset there in the mobility world is disaggregated. We don't have a car, for example, as a unique entity with the hardware, software, everything inside. But as we have heard in the previous presentation, there are many pieces of the puzzles here all, all together to, to make the function. So we have the car, we have the wheels, we have the engine that have different life cycle and maybe have to communicate with different stakeholders. There is the hardware that requires applications that maybe reside on the cloud. There are engines of artificial intelligence that need to collect information and make decisions for these devices. And there is sort of up and down between the, 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 the different software and mobility assets through the telco providers in this case. So through us, through the network. And through a, a, a list of protocols, as Andreas mentioned at the very beginning, standardized protocols among the different worlds. So if a mobility is experiencing disaggregation, in reality, also telco in the past years has experienced disaggregation. So look at a network node today. This is very different than it was 10 years ago. Today, we have a virtual functions. We have virtual routers that works with the generic purpose uh, uh, servers, for instance, uh, only the hardware on which we load the uh, software, on which we load the software that implement a virtual function, for instance, uh, a virtual switch, uh, maybe at the edge of the network. We have a software that goes on hardware for control, for artificial intelligence, uh, but also, as I mentioned previously, uh, there is a, a federation of networks uh, that have to talk together, and this is done through APIs. So the disaggregation is part of the telco as well. So if I look at the synergies between the two worlds, I see a lot of commonalities. And so telcos are really mature when, we come, when it comes to these kind of aspects, software defined and disaggregation. And the, the, the synergies between the two worlds can really leverage on the common experience to, to progress with the processes and and the features on both sides to make the things working together. But it's not only about, about technical requirements, about uh, capabilities of implementing these uh, two worlds. It's also a matter of business opportunities. Uh, we as Sparkle see a lot of potentials from this uh, uh, new economy because uh, it allows a service network operator like Sparkle to shift or at least to enhance and expand from existing connectivity and cloud assets and security provider to have a different new roles as a guarantor of identities, for instance, or verifiable credentials. We mentioned the, the need for digital twins, for DID, for variable credentials, potentially, and I, as, as operators uh, can provide digital identities as, as a service or twin as a service, blockchain as a service potentially, and manage and governance uh, the different federation, federations because this is what we can do. So it's not only about uh, evolving our networks uh, together with the mobile requirements uh, so that we are ready to boost this uh, new, new exciting evolution, uh, 
but also is uh, to go to the next step into the cloud and security uh, service provider. So is to have different role is uh, ecosystem. Going back to, to sum up, so, and uh, I wanted to go back to the definition of the integrated trust network uh, to, to end my speech and uh, try to emphasize what are the key pillars uh, and uh, how Sparkle fits uh, into this picture. So here we talk about integrated trust network. Integrated and refers to enablement of members to collaborate across organizational lines. So Sparkle, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a global service provider. So we handle disaggregation and federations, uh, putting the different pieces of the puzzle together already today on an international scale. So in, we, we know how to integrate things. Trust uh, is the second keyword, means uh, ensuring data privacy and great trust. And as you know, security is part of the DNA of our infrastructure. And this is today. And as mentioned previously, we can have a different roles tomorrow dealing with digital identities and verifiable credentials. And of course, the network is the last work for ITN is self-explaining. Sparkle is a global service provider with fixed connectivity. We, we have 600,000 kilometers of fibers, but not only. We have an important global IoT network. And following the requirements that come from this uh, um, synergies with Mobi and MAP, we will have more requirements to really boost this economy and to sustain the mobility ecosystem. And with that, I will and just remember that we are ready for mobility and contact us if you have uh, any questions. Roger, it's up to you now. Thank you, Antonella. Share. Voila. So hi, everyone. As Kelly introduced me earlier, I'm with Denso North America Research and Development. Denso has traditionally been an auto part supplier like Bosch or Conti or Delphi or Aptiv. We're headquartered in Japan and we have about 45 billion in annual revenue and almost 170,000 employees in 35 countries around the world. So why does a company like that wanna work with blockchain? Well, Denso's really developed a blockchain platform to help us shift from our traditional hardware products like alternators and uh, heat pumps and radiators and that kind of thing really two products and services. And that's where secure data becomes most important. And that's why we're researching blockchain in the mobility sector. Our key targets for the blockchain platform are traceability, mobility IoT and intercompany services enabled by the distributed authority, distributed identification and database authenticity. Denso has strengths in applying the QR code to link the physical world with the cyber world in traceability domains. Data collection and data preservation of the ledger, including in-vehicle end-to-end transactions. For traceability, we use blockchain to keep track of things, where they have been, where they are, and where they will be, along with transactions between seller and buyer, and so on. We do this through distributed ledgers to preserve the integrity of the data regarding locations and ownership and the transfer of goods along with payments between multiple parties. One interesting problem is how to connect the physical information of the things we want to track with their transactional records and preserve the integrity of that linkage. At Denso, we propose special QR codes that enable this cyber physical connection. Although we don't have time to talk in detail about this today, please stay tuned for future Mobi discussions on this topic in a few weeks time. Here are a couple of interesting use case examples where accurate preservation of product traceability is important to ensure the quality and integrity of the trusted trip record. First, we have cold chain, 
Here's where a blockchain can be used for agriculture or medical goods for traceability from start to end, including not only the pathway, but the temperature of the goods as we transport them. Second, for recording carbon footprint data to enable regulatory compliance or to levy taxes, and a very interesting application for governments, something like what Tram had mentioned earlier. So that's a brief introduction to Denso's traceability platform. Now let's talk about what we call the in-car blockchain. Some people and companies think data integrity can be solved by simply uploading vehicle data to the cloud and registering it in cloud blockchains. Sometimes even in a 4G LTE or 5G world, communications between vehicles and cloud operations are not reliable enough or ubiquitous enough to upload the entire set of important vehicle information in real time or near real time. In such cases, vehicle data stored in the car should be trustworthy and resilient to tampering, either physically through connected service, either physically or through connected service to the vehicle. One idea Denso is pursuing is simply not uploading tampered data to the edge or cloud, nor allowing its use for in-car services. We plan to use an onboard blockchain to help accomplish this. Traditional in-vehicle systems usually don't have high performance computing and usually can't process typical full blockchain stacks. So we move to a quite basic DLT and embedded security technology to coordinate the in-car device transactions and process them through hash change in the secure portion of the module system on a chip. Tampering is detected by comparing the values in the normal area versus in the trusted area. We then link an in-car blockchain technology with consortium blockchain technology, enabling local protection, direct trustworthy data registration for intercompany services, and we achieve the end-to-end -end integrity through the use of distributed ledgers. In-car blockchain ensures local data integrity of onboard devices for example, drive recorders, electronic control unit transaction records, ECU operation status, and it really increases the value of not just the hardware we incorporate, but the data and services which are so important to emerging mobility as a service, electric vehicles, or automated vehicle stakeholders in the new economy of movement. Now let's take a deeper look at the consortium or intercompany blockchain technology. Vehicles and other road users are increasingly becoming generators and consumers of the IoT data and information. New services emerge, and we believe they will tend towards automated services, machine to machine connectivity and localized analysis and insight generation are becoming the norm and in incorporating edge and distributed computing. For example, user based insurance rates depend on accurate and trustworthy data energy or fuel billing and fulfillment will become automated. For services like these, data integrity is absolutely necessary at levels probably not achievable in large scale with today's central authority. Denso is researching and developing trusted transaction and trusted trip services based on the distributed authority for multiple entities to the blockchain platform and its technology. Denso's current blockchain platform architecture is described at a high level in this diagram. Three prominent areas are shown. From the bottom, we call it open software area, made up of generally blockchain or deep distributed ledger solutions and cloud services. Then in the middle, we show the core area offering multiple functional blocks. And finally, the so-called customer area offering services. But today I want to focus on optimization. And I'll give a quick example of a technique we've developed. In this example, we look at vehicle history in terms of, let's say, a vehicle repair after a crash. Especially for appearance, it shows that the car was repaired successfully and looks like new, or at least looks like it did before the crash. Truthfulness of the data and the state of repair can be accurately recorded by storing the data in a multi-party blockchain. But such data to ensure the integrity of the repair, even beyond just appearance, can be relatively large. And if, if in the blockchain, there are many network repair shops and vehicle repair parts manufacturers, accumulating all this data on the chain would likely overload the system 
and cause a failure. But calculating the hash value from each data set and having the blockchain network store only those verifiable hash values, it makes tamper detection available and lowers the strain on the system, making it more scalable. That's where blockchain really starts to show its value. Denzel's blockchain platform is continuing development and improvement. For optimization, we showed one example of improving the scalability by storing hash values. What we also are investigating, for example, distributed sidechain groupings, connecting to main consortium blockchains through cloud services. But if Denso and other companies try to do all of this on our own, the usefulness of a distributed network loses its value. There are plenty of examples inside and outside of the mobility community that illustrate when companies try to do this alone or with only unilateral transactions, the solution doesn't scale and sort of dies on the vine. We feel that by working closely with Mobi and MEF consortium members, the ITN is where multilateral relationships will flourish and the power of the network of value blossoms. That's why we look for collaboration opportunities external to Denso within the ITN and hope that this brief introduction helps you think about your own journey using blockchain and the integrated trust network for your mobility future. So thanks very much. With that, I'll yield the floor back to Kelly and we can uh, go towards questions. Thank you. Great, thank you all so much. Um, so we can dive into a Q&A now. Um, I know there's some discussion in the chat. Uh, do you all want to still cover those questions that were submitted? Um, sure. I'm thinking maybe may I show one slide real quick to talk about the whole uh, verified credential ecosystem and how it works um, so that we can, can be a little bit clearer. Would that work? Um, Andreas, what do you think? Go ahead. It, yeah, it seemed like there's, there's questions on, on how this all works. So, Essentially, uh, this is what we're trying to go. This is a slide from another talk of mine. Uh, we use the W3C standard on VC, and in this ecosystem, there are three types of stakeholders, the issuer, the holder, and the verifier. Uh, and <clears throat> they all require digital twins, and all the digital twins are connected to a DID, and the DID is connected, uh, is linked to, is the uh, anchor in MobiNet or ITN, for example, and every single node of the ITN has copies of all the dates. And so the issuer and the holders always write uh, their information and the verifiers read the information. And when you create this whole system here, you cr essentially create two separate channels. The, the lower channels is um, the public channel. And all this information is readable by anybody who's using uh, the trusted services of the ITN. The upper channel is where the trusted private communication happen. Uh, so if um, the EDMP uh, give me uh, a driver license, I'm holding it. And then I go to a, a bar or TSA and I show my driver license. Um, they can check if I'm over the minimum uh, required drinking age. Uh, and they can read the information and say that, yes, the holder of this uh, identity is over the drinking age. I don't need to give them my birthday and I don't need to show them my ID card with my home address on it. Um, so, so this is the only part that's blockchain related. Everything else is not blockchain related and payments happen up here. Did that help? Uh, I thought that would be a, a quick way to demonstrate it at the two channels. Great. Um, so do we want to cover some? Yeah, I was, I was just going to perhaps answer the question from Ben Town, which I think is, is really uh, critical. He asked, uh, are micropayments worth it given the high actual cost of all the network communication and so on? Um, and my answer to that is, um, that the cost of compute storage and connectivity is just per bit is, is going down all the time. And we're learning new uh, and effective ways of, of 
of doing the uh, calculations more effectively and that we're going to find that balance but i'm i'm absolutely sure that we're going to just see increasingly efficient uh, overheads on let's call them transactions rather than payments because there could be many many transactions or micro transactions that don't involve any payment transfer of information and so on so i i, I think that we can look forward to uh smaller and smaller overhead that will justify uh, more and more use cases of micro transactions. I couldn't agree with uh, you more, uh, Daniel. Uh, most of the cost of micropayments today is from banking and credit card, uh, and the ITN will help uh, reduce that cost tremendously. And when we talk about transaction and micro transaction, it's not, it's not uh, monetary involved. A lot of it is data. Um, and and uh, most the way Zootopia works, uh, we see the payment as a um, accounting ledger and settlement can happen uh, once a day or something for the providers. And all that happens not on chain. And there are other questions, Kelly, that we should answer or should um, we um, go to the submitted questions? Yeah, we can go to some submitted questions. I think we had a lot of discussion in the chat covered. Um, so a question for you, Tram. Um, why can't one company run the integrated trust network? Why does it have to be a group of companies? Well, uh, we essentially do have that <laughs> right now, one company run uh, run a network like Google, uh, Facebook, for example, and history has proven that monopolies are bad and uh, it won't work in the connected economy uh, and decentralization uh, with uh, mul multiple organization uh, um, with diverse entities from different ecosystem is the way forward for the, um, for the Web3 uh, commerce. And also uh, important uh, that is eliminate the single point of failure. Uh, for example, we all have identifiers today. Uh, my Gmail address, for example, is technically not owned by me, it's owned by Google. And if uh, something happens, uh, I might not have access to it anymore. Uh, my website, uh, do I have one? If there's a tramvo.com, how do I prove that I don't own that website? and whatever that you find on that website is not me. Uh, so this is why a decentralized I, ITN uh, is important. Great. I think so it's also worth thinking about, you know, the history of networking as just a, an analogy where you had mainframes dominating in the 60s and 70s. And then as compute uh, became more feasible at smaller scales, you started to see you know, the personal computer and you start to see local area networks and there's always going to be a balance. There's going to be huge compute in the cloud. There are always going to be very large computers, but then we're also seeing at the other end of the scale compute going into uh, smartphones and, and now IoT. I think you'll see the same thing with trust networks like this, that there's uh, uh, more and more um, a, a sort of centripetal force acting on on this on the trust so that we're not relying on on sort of hubs on on major clusters of of trust but um the 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 world will get used to the idea that um we need to decentralize trust and that's what integrated trust network is about great so we have a question submitted in the chat about um node cost um, so is there an ITN node cost outside of the data storage requirements? And is there any technical information on the node requirements? There is. <clears throat> um, it's all uh, well documented. Um, you know, depending on on um, you know, as 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 we scale up primarily on the on the on the um, uh, the non-blockchain bit, that's you know, can can um, can go up over over time as 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 transaction volume, et cetera increases but it will be um you know uh a couple of grand a couple of grand a month 
and uh, there is uh, no cost to to technically join uh, except you have to be a mobi mm -hmm. member or a member or if you are part of a consortium uh, bring the consortium and we'll we'll definitely would love to talk with you about it Great, so we have a submitted question um, for Antonella. What's the timeline for the test network and for the production network? Hello, okay. So uh, the, the test network is already up and running. Uh, we have already some nodes from uh, the uh, IT and known members uh, running and under verification. So we expect to, to have it uh, ready and uh, certified by, let's say, June, probably even earlier. And then it will, it will take uh, some time to go to the commercial one, following the same requirements and implementation on that. So to be optimistic, we think that within the year, we might have something uh, really commercial, otherwise at the beginning of next year. Andreas, I don't know if you have more, more, more views on that. But the message is that uh, we are working really hard. The blockchain is already established uh, and uh, we want to be fast because uh, there is the urgency for this uh, you know, new economy to boost. And this is why we are working and we are also searching for new partners to boost it even more. Great. Um, so we have another submitted question. This one is for Roger. Um, how exposed is the data that is put on the ITN? Um, it's 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 not exposed if you choose not to. So each uh, uh, owner of their own um, digital twin can choose what kind of information to expose to which kind of um, uh, partner, I guess, within the network or other other agent within the network. I think Tram talked about this a little bit um, uh, when she when she put her slide on on the on the screen. And so it, it's, it's not it's part of the uh, advantage of ITN is that you can, as a participant, choose which information uh, will be shared and for what reason and with who. It's part of the value. It's not like everything gets uh, sent to everyone. Um, it's, it's definitely the option of the uh, participant who holds the credential. And uh, Daniel, is there a limit to the number of organizations that can run nodes on ITN? Uh, no, no limit at all. Uh, in fact, we're aiming for the largest number that we can um, because it makes it more robust, more secure. The more nodes there are, um, the harder it becomes to attack um, uh, malicious attacks on, on, on the integrated trust network. Um, but it's definitely viable at you know the lower numbers, but uh, we're aiming in the in in uh, in the coming months to get to, you know, the 10, 12 range, and then we'd like to grow beyond that. So no limit. Great. So we have a chat question um, regarding in vehicle blockchain. Um, if I understood correctly, in order to detect tampering or information of information, the local blockchain needs to reside in some secure space. Why is storing the plain information in a secure space not sufficient? And what does the hash chain improve here? So the idea is that there's a blockchain throughout the um, nodes. Well, we, we, we could call them nodes within the vehicle. So you might have a engine controller, a brake controller, a, a gateway to uh, uh, connected systems. And each one of these uh, modules holds a um, a blockchain hash of the data that's being exchanged. If we find something that's tampered uh, through the um, uh, accessible, either physically accessible or through your connect connection uh, from a cellular system or a wireless LAN system or any kind of uh, outside connectivity, even, even up to and including the, um, the OBD2, uh, we can detect that that um, 
data has been either forged or changed in some way that uh, different from the original operation of the of the vehicle and the exchange of information between the uh, ECUs. And so that detection of that tampering of the data that's on board is reflected between in the difference between the hash data in the secure uh, area and the hash data in the, let's call it open data. Great, thank you. Um, for Andreas, uh, what's the difference between being an ITN node operator and being an ITN user? I think you may be muted, Andreas, if you're talking. I'm sorry. I just got a got a very important phone call that I had to take. Um, could you? I'm sorry about that. Could you please repeat the question? Sure, no problem. Um, what's the difference between being an ITN node operator and being an ITN user? Um, you know, on the you know, as an ITN node operator, you're actually operating the infrastructure and offering the ITN services to the ITN users. As the ITN users, you just um, have a digital twin and you communicate to the ITN through your digital twin or set of digital twins. Great, um, and Tram, who owns the ITN? Um, all the equity uh, owners uh, of the ITN uh, uh, node operators, uh, the MOBI members, the MAF members, uh, and future consortia that are joining uh, the ITN and including future investors uh, when we open it up for investors. Great. Um, and for governance of the ITN, Antonella, how does that work? How is the ITN governed? Is is mainly on a consensus basis. So uh, that, that's a, that's a, the simple the simple answer to, to this question. O, of course, so we have our governance, but the, the basic principle is uh, the consensus of the members. Great. Um, I think one of our last questions, um, just more information about testnet. We've heard a lot about that. Andreas, can you explain what exactly a testnet is and how that's constructed? Sorry again. It's like it's like I'm I'm dealing with a family um, emergency. Can you can you repeat the question again? Sure. We can also have someone else answer as well. Um, that would be that would be nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. If anyone, I could, I can take it. Okay. I can take it. Yeah. So the the the, the test net is a network of a number of nodes. Uh, or the blockchain that are implemented uh, in this moment on a public cloud, because we thought that that was the most secure environment, but potentially, as, a, as, as, a, as we mentioned during the presentation, could be uh, on, a private, on a private cloud. And that implemented the basic core of fun functionalities, the one that Daniel explained, so the core functions and the lower layer. So, and then what we do on this, uh, on this uh, test net, apart from testing the full software of the blockchain, uh, we, we, we do tests of transactions, uh, uh, you know, that uh, may happen in, in real life. And, uh, and of course, this is an evolving activities, uh, you know, software always, always evolve and uh, we will follow up until uh, we think that the network is ready to be commercial. And, and just to add to what Antonella said, we're also learning about what are the important KPIs and you know what uh, effectively is the service level agreement that we need to provide to users. Um, so if, for example, one of the nodes goes down, how, does, how do we make sure that there's con uh, continuance of service and so on and so forth? So the, the, the test network um, is also uh, partly a learning exercise for us. Um, as well as the uh, the points that uh, Antonella brought up about uh, constantly evolving and, and learning the system. So another um, chat question we have, will ITN be interoperable with other blockchains and or internal ERP systems? Yes, uh, we are technology agnostic. Uh, we started out using Fabric 
but we are, of course, uh, looking to work with other uh, chains out there. Uh, the node operator would have to run a node that contains all the different chains that the ITN uh, allows. I don't know um, if any. And, and you'd agree, Tram, it's very important to us that we do, su we do support multiple uh, DLTs. Um, that's definitely our, our vision and it will be a process of onboarding additional DLTs, but that, that is our direction. Great, we have um, another question for Roger. Uh, do in-vehicle communications uh, like CAN bus need to involve to higher, need to evolve to higher speed embedded architectures like ethernet in order for ITN based systems to be realized? Is there a cost penalty? So yeah, I was I was trying to answer that on 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 the chat, but I, I really think uh, most in vehicle networks are already evolving because the amount of compute power necessary for almost all the new features we're seeing, even on mid or low tier vehicles like uh, you know lane keeping or uh, automatic emergency braking, with the sophistication and the data the data processing necessary to do that kind of thing uh, naturally evolves the. Uh, higher speed embedded architectures. However, that being said, I don't think it's necessary. That's a necessary um, foundation for uh, things like the ITN to work in the mobility sector. Um, we can have sort of a separate, um, you know, private blockchain in each vehicle that connects itself to a more consortium level blockchain um, in the wider, what would I call it? Uh, network sphere, um, including, you know, edge and, um, and uh, cloud, cloud computing. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, we have another question about digital twins. Uh, when referencing digital twins related to sensors, is that the same as identity certificates being issued for each sensor? Yes, the, the identity certificates are going to be issued for for uh, um, for each uh, for each sen uh, sensor. Yeah, they might not they might not the sensor might not sign on its behalf, right? Um, someone uh, another authorized uh, um, set of keys will might uh, do that, but there is there is a there is a an, a, a fair public credential that. Um, proves the 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 origin of that of that of that sensor. Great. I think we have uh, just one more submitted question about um, ITN nodes. Um, is there a limit to the number of organizations that can run nodes and can one unilaterally control um, ITN? Uh, sh shall I take that one? Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, no, no, uh, one node can't unilaterally control the other nodes. Um, that, 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 that's what um, the whole business is about, is that decentralization and the robustness and ensuring that um, uh, you can't get that sort of uh, manipulation by one of the, uh, one of the node operators. And uh, I think this sort of connects back to the previous question about is there a maximum number of node operators and, and, and companies and operating nodes? No, there, there isn't, but they would have to be accepted and onboarded by the existing node operators. And we've put together a governance framework for that. Great, I believe that's all the questions we have. Um, if any of the panelists wanna contribute anything else before we end today. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is a very important initiative for us that we've been working for a few years. And uh, I'm very happy to see the turnout and all the questions we have. Uh, if any of you are interested, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, we welcome and the more the merrier. Yes, thank you everyone for joining. Um, you can go to dlt.mobi for more information. Um, and again, this lecture is being recorded, so it'll be available on our website, um, and we're always available for questions um, and learning more about ITN.
Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.